One, thank you for joining us for the Soka Mom Summit. We have had one heck of a weekend. Lots of wonderful sessions, lots of activities. We've done a lot of different things this time, and I hope you really enjoyed it. We are now at the end of the Soka Mom Summit, and you may have noticed there was a theme that kind of ran through the summit. It's how important it is to share your story. We heard birthing stories. We heard, you know, advanced maternal age stories. We heard business and marketing stories. We've heard pretty much every kind of story you can think of, historical, all of that. And it's all in the middle of a time that we all have a story of our own. At some point, we'll be looking back on this time when we were dealing with a pandemic when we were dealing with unrest, right? We're all going to have a different story about this time. So today I have a very, very special guest with us who is a champion of stories, right? She loves to help people tell their stories, to get things out there. And now she has some stories for us, some stories that will inspire you about women who have done amazing, amazing things. And they kind of illustrate how powerful your story can be. So this session is about the power in telling your story. So I am very, very happy to introduce Margot Mocha Ochoa. Hi, thank you Thank you. I'm so honored that you're here. Honored to come. Let's just kind of jump in. When you think about stories, right, and how different our stories are, why is it so important to share your story with other people? Because it's one thing to just kind of talk about them among yourselves. Like in my family growing up, I knew all about my mom's childhood and it was pretty entertaining. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. But I am probably the only one that knows that me and people who experienced it with her, maybe my brother, if he was listening, mm -hmm. but her story didn't extend beyond us. Why is it so important to share your story widely? I mean, I, uh, as you were speaking, I um, remember well, coming up with, you know, my mom and telling my mom was a storyteller. Like you told, she told a story and you were like on the edge of your seat. And um, my, and she always told me that my grandmother, that people would come around to hear my grandmother tell a story because she did it so well, right? Um, and, you know, th that's just who we are. We know how to tell stories that, that connect and island people, that's just who we are. We teach their stories. Right? I mean, you hear this, you know, Anansi stories and all of this, but that's who we are by nature. We're animated people. We teach through stories. So, you know, we have been so good at teaching, um, teaching what we need to teach our children through stories. We have not quite been the, the best at letting the world know our stories and what makes us so special, what makes island folks so um, original and different and what we have to contribute. So, you know, it's my hope that we really start to embrace. That's why I thought this summit was amazing with all of the stories and the importance of storytelling. It's who we are as a people. We are storytellers and we've got a special flair as island people with the way we tell our stories, whether it's through books and our music that's so magnetic and all of that. But, you know, that's who we are. We are storytellers. You look at even Carnival. Carnival, you know, um, what is it? It's not Juve. It's uh, the night before. Yeah, Juve. Yeah. Juve. That, 
you know, people think it's like, people think, oh, mud and all of that, but there's so much political stories that are happening that night, you know, resistance and tell, we just are stories, tellers and expressive people by nature, but we need to do a better job in letting the world know what our contributions have been through telling our stories. It is so important. So speaking of those contributions, you have made me a fan of a set of sisters. I wanna just go straight to their story. Um, in, I believe you said Paris? Yeah. Yes. So we're dealing with protests and all sorts of things right now, right? There's a lot going on, a lot of racial tension. And you would think that it wouldn't be like it is now, but this is not new. There was a time where we really, really couldn't express ourselves. And tell me about these sisters who were able to help people express themselves. Sure. Well, we look at the the uh, literary movement, the 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 literary, the Black literary consciousness um, movement, um, which was the Negritude movement, and um, these were sisters who had folks in their homes. So they're from Martinique, um, Paulette Nardal, uh, the first to integrate the University of Paris Sorbonne, and um, she was a person that you know, knew the value of bringing people together and bringing people together, all, all cultures together. But she was such a fan of the Harlem Renaissance and fascinated by, you know, what was happening in Harlem that by the time that she got to Paris, and that was the time when, you know, there were black folk in Paris and, you know, James uh, Baldwin and Langston Hughes and, um, you know, Josephine Baker, and Marcus Garvey, on Sundays, these black folks knew that the place to be was in Clamar. And this is right outside of Paris. And Paulette and her sisters, Jean and Narda, Jean and um, Andre, what they would do is they would host a literary salon in their apartment every single Sunday. So it would bring together all of these philosophers, these great thinkers, these black folks would come together to discuss what was happening. And you're talking, 1930s. And so you're talking, you know, people coming together, these great minds, these thinkers coming together to, to just discuss literature. But what ended up happening was they would hear this. And, and, I, and I also have to mention that uh, Suzanne Césaire, also from Martinique, and she was Emer Césaire, the first uh, prime minister of, um, of Martinique, his wife, um, she was their friend and they would get together and host all of these people. But as everyone was talking, they would write, they would write. And so what ended up happening was with all of this discourse and all of this that was happening, they actually wrote the blueprint to the Negritude movement. And the Negritude movement, so come on, right? I'm a mom. So, <laughs> so um, yes. So this is this is it. This is authentic and raw, <laughs> right? So this, this is how this works, okay? <laughs> right, right. Just in case people don't know, way of being part of it, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, all right. Because all of a sudden she had something behind here. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they would get together, and as folks were talking, they would write, and what they ended up writing was the blueprint to the Negritude movement, which mm -hmm. was first movement. So you're talking about, we always talk about Marcus Garvey and the Back to Africa and getting us together as a, as a collective, as Black folks around the world. Well, these were the first people, women, people, who wrote it down and created this literary movement that was based on writers. Well, what are we going to do? How can we contribute to the resistance? How can writers collectively come together around the world with a common theme of liberating black folks around the world, but coming from a literary perspective, because they realized that as writers, they had a responsibility. What can we do? What is our role in this? So they created 
a global pan-Africanist movement from the perspective of writers and created this literary movement. Now, what's important to understand is, although they created a movement and the fact that they were women, what was unique about this is that it had nothing to do with the economics. They, it had nothing to do with money and power, but it had everything to do with uniting black folks around the world as a collective group of people to raise our consciousness and to give us pride in who we are. Mm -hmm. And what kind of blueprint can we write to get everyone to read it and get it and get together? So they were trying to create what they had in their apartment and create this blueprint so around the world. And think of the word negritude, negritude. Like, I love that word, right? You don't even have to explain, it's black with an attitude. It was created in this apartment by these women from the Caribbean. Now, what ended up happening was the men came, Césaire, Amé Césaire, and Senghor and Damas, they were men, and um, Paulette Nardal is, is quoted as saying rather sarcastically, well, what could we do? We were only women. The men had to take it and run with it. Because at that point, women were, still weren't taken seriously, much less black women. But they knew, and the men knew, and everyone in that apartment knew that they were the ones that wrote the blueprint that created a literary, black literary conscious, consciousness, conscious movement that we could read and follow and come together as black folks and use our creativity to push the movement forward. Women, Caribbean women. Now, speaking of Caribbean women who start movements, you also introduced me to another set of favorites mm -hmm. from the Caribbean. Yes. Who, I mean, revolution. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. I mean, and it's so interesting that we had conversations about these women in the middle of everything that's going on right now. What? What? It's just like I needed to hear that because you know we all feel kind of powerless yeah. right now. It's yeah. like stay in your house or something terrible is going to happen to you, yeah. whether it be from the police or yeah. from the coronavirus. You just you feel very powerless. Yeah. But you have these Caribbean women who were more powerless than we would ever be right now. Yeah. And they found their power. They sure did. Tell me about what they did. Tell all of us about what they did and why their story is so important. Because sure. we didn't have it for a long time, but now that we have it, tell me why this story is so important. Sure. Well, you know, I know where you're going is, is, is Mary Prince of Bermuda, but even before Mary Prince, it's important to also talk about, you know, when you see that this city is on fire and that city is on fire, it's important to also talk about, you know, people like Sarah Bassett of Bermuda in like 1730. Sarah Bassett, and the interesting thing about Sarah Bassett of, of Bermuda is that um, she was hung and, and burned in uh, the capital of Bermuda in 1730. Why? Because the story is that uh, she poisoned um, the, her, her, her slave masters. And she poisoned her niece's slave masters because the story was that there was something not right there, that the, the niece was being abused, but something fueled Sarah to say, uh-uh, um, no, uh, this is not what we're doing. So what ended up happening was that there was a poison that she had that she would give to her niece and the niece would put it in their food and the masters ended up passing away. The interesting thing about this story though, which I think is, is, is fascinating, the particular type of poison that she had could only be found in Haiti. So it begs the question of what kind of network was happening in 1730? What kind of resistance was going on in her island that she was able to access this stuff, to be able to say, uh-uh, my niece isn't suffering anymore. Um, I'm not suffering anymore. We're fighting back. But the interesting thing about Sarah, because there is a statue of her in Bermuda, and 
the stat, the, the story says that when they took her and they tried her and they said, we're burning her and they paraded her through the streets as she walked through Bermuda, they were like, you know, people were watching and she said, uh uh-uh, no, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing, come follow. There was a defiance in her. She wasn't scared. It was important for her to go out with this strength. Like, you wanna see a show? Come see a show. They're about, they're about to burn me here. Come see a show. And then she also said, you all are gonna have a memory of me long after I go. Mm. We burned her and there was this purple flower that came up. That flower, she's like, she said, you're gonna have a remembrance of me for the entire, you know, the entire island will always have a, a memory of me. Do you know that this flower grows all over Bermuda? Sally, sorry, Sarah Bassett. And there is a statue erected of her in Bermuda today, this black woman. But who probably got in, in, inspired by her? Here comes Mary Prince. Mary Prince who was born a slave in Bermuda and you know, was treated horribly, horribly. At one time her, her slave masters took her to, I believe it was Turks and Caicos where she was put in a, a salt mine. So she was, they, you know, they were cultivating salt. Slaves were in there cultivating and mining salt. Meanwhile, while they were in there for 17 hour work days, the flesh, the, the salt was eating at their flesh, salt eating at their flesh, 17 hours. Mary was taught to read by the Moravian church. What did she do? She learned to read and she always wanted to be free. She eventually got married, but could never be with her husband really because her husband was a free man, but she was not a free woman. Eventually her masters took her to England, to London. And when they took her to London, it just so happened that at that time they were contemplating the abolishment of slavery, but they were kind of, we don't know, you know, having these meetings in parliament and all of that. Well, in the meantime, there was an abolitionist who said, I need you to tell me your story. Let's write your book. So her and this abolitionist started to write the book. They wrote the book. After the third edition selling out in London, it was the talk of London. This narrative of the slave woman and all of the horrors that she's been through. That eventually they invited her to parliament to speak about this book. And it was that book that was the tipping point of the abolishment of slavery in all British colonies around the world. So when we're talking about the power of your story and how important, Mary Prince wrote her story of her pain and, and she was probably thinking, I need to get back to my husband, I need to get back to my man, right? Did she, was she thinking at the time, this is going to have a worldwide impact so when we're having Emancipation Day and we're waving our flags at Emancipation Day, we need to think about Mary Prince. Mm -hmm. Because if it was not for this Bermudan slave who decided to write her story, there would be no Emancipation Day. So when you're looking at all the islands, the islands that were, you know, owned or, or you know, owned by the British, that this woman's story helped to emancipate our ancestors. So you can never discount the power of a single story, never. We were free because of her book that sold out by the third edition. Mm. So imagine how many copies had to sell. Well, this first print ran out, second print ran out, third print ran out and Parliament was like, well, who is this woman? We need to call her in. All right, tell us. It's different when you actually hear the narrative of what mm -hmm. someone went through, it gives you a different, my God, right? The power of the, of, of the story of Mary Prince, us, island women, but we don't talk about that. Can you imagine if most of us started, if we really could internalize the things that we have done, the contributions that we have made, we don't talk about it. I think we would have very, very different people um, growing up right now. Yeah. I know my daughter 
learned about the green book yes. and she, you know, she said, I've been waiting to tell people about the green book, but I haven't had a reason. And she had a history project. Your and, daughter, uh, by the way. Oh. <laughs> You're raising <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> But she was so excited to tell this story to somebody. And she finally got a history project and she said, okay, I'm gonna make a game and wrap it around the story of the green book, yeah. right? So she turns in her assignment and the teacher, this is her social studies and history teacher, had no idea what it was about, none. And she's in the eighth grade, right? So when I thought about that, I said, well, that story, when Eden heard it, that's mm -hmm. now going to change how this woman teaches from mm -hmm. now on. At least I hope it does. You know, mm -hmm. when she teaches about the civil rights movement and when she teaches about, you know, segregation and hopefully she's teaching about sundown towns, but Eden was able to tell her a story that if she allows it to, could change how she does things and affect all of the people that she comes into contact with in that classroom. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about the power of your story, that's why I think it's so important for it to be told widely. That's, that's, that's really important, it is. you know, because if I'm the only one who knows about Mary Prince and you're the only one that knows, you know, what are we, I mean, we are who we are now, mm -hmm. but little people need to know, young people need to know that they are powerful. I think that's another thing that you have this ancestry that, I mean, resilient is not the word. And when you're thinking, oh, I can't do this, having that story within you mm -hmm. is important. So talk to me about what story you heard that changed your life in that way and had that kind of ripple effect. What, what story jumps out at you? Well, I mean, there are so many. There are so many that have really poured into me and um, had me think of myself in a different way um, in this world. I mean, I remember being in Paris and discovering Dumas and realizing that, uh, that the Three Musketeers were black, that the writer of the Three Musketeers black and Caribbean. The Count of Monte Cristo was Caribbean. Like what? And there are statues of them in Paris, right? That, but you know, even as I look around the world now and I see these city, cities on fire and protest and can't take it anymore. You know, I went to Copenhagen this summer and when I look around and I see what's happening around the world, I can't help but think of the three queens of St. Croix who, you know, in, in, in the 1800s, these women, so in St. Croix, every year they would have, once a year, they would have the time when the slaves would, I think it was the beginning of the year, they would have their time where they had their time off and they could kind of, you know, party, drink a little bit, but they could also decide if they wanted to do the same job, if they wanted to switch jobs. And I'm saying job, right? But you know what I mean? But what ended up happening, which gives me chills, <clears throat> What ended up happening was at that time there was, and they were partying, whatever, there was a young man who they thought was being, you know, disorderly, I guess that's the word for it, disorderly. And um, the police beat him and took him to the precinct. And he was beat so bad that he eventually had to go to the hospital. So a bunch of uh, the slaves that were, you know, partying or whatever, they knew about what happened, but they had heard that he was dead, that the police had beat him to death. So they went to the police station 
rioting um, and didn't know what happened to this young man, this black young man, this black boy. So the women now said, what? Uh, Queen Mary, they called her Mary, her name was Mary. But, you know, eventually she became Queen Mary through history. So Mary said, Mary, and she had, you know, three of her, her counterparts. There was Agnes and there was Matilda, there was Mary. And they said, you know what, enough is enough. We've had it. Um, listen, we are about to burn this place down. We've had enough. They turn around to everybody, they said, listen, we are about to have an uprising because enough is enough. They said, we are about to do this and anyone who does not participate is off with your head because we are having a collective movement and we are burning this place down. So if you look up the history and you look up Fireburn of St. Croix, it's these three women that led a resistance that said enough is enough and what they ended up doing, I think 50 plantations ended up being burned down. Uh, some stores were burned down, but they were careful not to burn down the ones of the, the, the people that treated them well. But however, they were just like, enough is enough. And these three queens led the resistance. Well, what happened finally, you know, after some days, it was, it was, it was uh, you know, quelled. And uh, these women went to trial. They ended up. They did not want to kill them because they did not want them to go down in history as martyrs. So they end up shipping these women to Copenhagen, 1878, Copenhagen, where they were um, in jail in Copenhagen. And um, while they were there, apparently they wrote a book. There is documentation that these women wrote a book, but it cannot be found. So they're still looking for that. That's why I was in Copenhagen. But what is also interesting is this, is that throughout history, the Dutch, uh, the Dutch government ended up issuing a formal apology for slavery. Not only that, but they erected a statue right on the docks um, in the city in Copenhagen and right in front of the sugar plantation where they used to bring the sugar and goods in from the Caribbean, there is this beautiful statue of Queen Mary, this black woman in Denmark, mm. commemorating, and it's Queen Mary Thomas. Mm. They've got of this woman commemorating the horrors of what happened, and it's because of these women. Now they were in jail. They were in jail, but they ended up abolishing slavery in St. Croix and St. Thomas because of the actions of these women. Mm. So we think that resistance doesn't work and resistance is ugly, it's grimy. It's, but when you can't take it anymore, mm. it burns. We have a history, not only, so we look at, you know, Harriet Tubman and, mm. you know, all of the history of our cousins here in the US who were remarkable people, Nat Turner, all of these remarkable people, but we don't understand that we have been resisting. Black folks have been, so you're talking about 1619 here, 1502, black people started arriving in the Caribbean and they have been resisting since 1502. As a matter of fact, by the time they decided to bring slaves over to the US, they were kind of like, you know what? These are some live ones here in the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> running off in the mountains and they were like you said you had the Haitian I was gonna say I know they yeah. were over the Haitians yeah. they were just like mm. <laughs> you see those in them islands I don't know if it's and for me I'm thinking maybe it's because the weather was so similar to that which they were taken from in, in Africa that it's that equator exactly so, so they were <laughs> You know, they, they maybe the winter had something to do with over here, and it was kind of like, oh God, we're here suffering. What is this? They didn't. Mm -hmm. It took a, a little while for them to get their footing, but in the Caribbean, it was just like, okay, all right, it's uh, <laughs> we know what's up with hills. That's fine. Look, we can go up in there. <laughs> I don't know what's up with these ones here. <laughs> these are some live ones. Let's see what we can do over here. You know, but. You know, we have been resisting. We have a rich 
history. There's not an island that didn't have a resistance. Yes. There's not an island that didn't fight back. These are not unique stories. These are stories that we just don't know. Mm. How come I didn't know about these three queens until last year, I would say October? I had no idea that St. Croix burned down because of three women. I don't know. But it's like, you know, I guess the law of attraction. For me, once I started to research these women and become so fascinated by them, I just started getting more and more and more stories. There's so many more, but these, this is just the tip of the iceberg. But the point is we have been resisting for years. It is in our blood. It is in our DNA resistance. It is, it flows through us. All we need to know are the stories. So everyone has their, I may not be able to go downtown and, and, and stand on the Black Lives Matter, you know, um, the Black Lives Matter that Mar Muriel Bowser sanctioned and is getting sued for, by the way, anyway. Um, you know what I mean? I may not be able to do that, but I have my, I have my job and my duty in this resistance. And I may not be able to do that, but guess what? While they're burning it down, I know that, you know, I do some, I do work for the NAACP and the National Urban League. And they always say, NAACP kicks the door down and the Urban League comes in now with the programming. Mm -hmm. So while they are kicking the door down, we are still needed. Who's writing down the strategy? Who's writing down the blueprint? Who's writing down the demands? Who's coming in with that? We all have our position to play in this resistance. So the least we can do as creatives is take our talent now and say, how can we contribute? How can we contribute to the resistance? Suzanne Cesaire, oh, which is, she is my, my, I mean, look, I cannot even, I cannot even express the love I have for this woman. She is my favorite in history, uh, another from Martinique. And she talked about the role of the creative. Mm. Her position was, and you, that she created Afro surrealism, the, the theory of Afro surrealism. And the basis of this theory was that all of those, those folks coming through the Middle Passage and had to pass through the Caribbean, those bodies that went overboard, they are spirits and they are not dead. They are there, and but they exist in a different realm, right? A different realm. And you talk about writers that access uh, the different realm. You look at Beloved. There was a spirit that came back, right, to teach something. They are considered Afro-surrealist writers. Another one, Bernice McFadden, who always, you know, tends to come in. And she's got Bajan blood in her, Bajan. She, so she, you know, always tends to write um, in and access and write about, you know, she talked about, she has this book called The Gathering of Waters. Um, and she talked about... Uh, Gosh, what was that? Katrina. You know, she was taught in her in her book, she weaved in and the Emmett Till story in there. And then she also weaved in um, Katrina and the hurricane. And when the hurricane came, like it was a wrath up. Because I don't know if you've heard the theory that hurricanes are the wrath of the African woman. Hurricanes. They mm. come back, they start off of the Cape of you know St. Baird, where slaves were kind of on the mm. ships and waiting to come across them. So how hurricanes are formed and where they're formed, that it's the the strength of it comes from those souls that are underneath that water and mm. all those hurricanes. I have never said this um, in, in a forum before, but I'm, I'm fascinated with hurricanes and all of that, but we don't realize that that last one that happened, the big one, was it Dor Dorian? The day that that one was created, it was created, so it was created in uh, the end of August, right? No, mid-August. But the day that it became a hurricane, like it was upgraded from tropical storm to hurricane, mm -hmm. was the anniversary of Emmett Till's death. 
and see that story right there, the way his mother did that, that was a powerful story because she could have just done, because he wasn't the only one that this ever happened to, you know, but she changed the world the day she said, oh no, this casket is going to be open and he is going to get to tell his story and I am going to get to tell mine. Exactly. The day that hurricane hit and it became a category five was the same day the first ship, 400th year anniversary mm. to the day of 1619. So that day that we were, that we were, you know, commemorating Jamestown and all of that, Dorian turned into a category five, the most mm. devastating hurricane to hit this side of the world. Mm. So Suzanne Cesare, so given that background, Suzanne Cesare spoke of those bodies that are at the bottom of the Caribbean Sea and how they are not dead and how they mm. inspire us and how they are here, you know, they are all we have to do as creatives. So she said that creatives, their role in the resistance is this, that they are put here to imagine a world. So it's only the creative that could say, that could imagine equality. The rest of society could not imagine it. They're just, okay, we're going about our daily lives, but it's the writers, it's the painters, it's the dancers, that dare to imagine a world that's equal, a world where the black man is liberated and lives free. And what do they do? They interpret it in their writing, they interpret it in dance, they interpret, they give us something to talk about. They then take that, but the, the fact that they can imagine that means that they are accessing that other realm, which Suzanne says there, called the marvelous, because it's only in the marvelous that you can imagine that type of world. So creatives have the ability to access and go into the marvelous and imagine this type of world, dare to see it and come back and write about it. Then what they do is they bring it to us and now we come and discuss it. So the creatives have that responsibility. They're given a gift to access this dimension, the marvelous, which teaches us that, because you, you think about it, how can people even who are oppressed for years and years and years and years, hundreds of years, even think to dare to think that there could possibly be a world where we could be free and equal? Like, where does that come from? Where does that's, that come from? That's, and that's what she talked about, the marvelous, the mm. creators have their responsibility and that's why they create movements and Renaissance because they dare to dream and dare to imagine. But the imagining is not of them. They access that realm with the ancestors. And Toni Morrison talked about it too. This realm of the marvelous, you think you even listen to the way she speaks and some of the things, where did you get that from? You see how she stood up and why do you think I even have to write about anybody else that doesn't even look like me? Who, who said that to The like, confidence, the confidence with which knowing. she spoke. It is like you said, it's a knowing. It's when a knowing. You know what you know and you know who you are. I think that is what is so powerful about, you know, listening to her old speeches was that, you know, it was not put on her, it was coming out of her, right? It was like, she, and, then, and then her sharing this with us, right? You know, some people get it. Mm -hmm. And other people feel it like, oh, yeah. I see. I, yep, that's exactly how I feel. But the responsibility of interpreting yes, yeah. for yeah. everybody else. I think about Brown versus Board of Education, and this was really wild to me. Um, when I was in law school, we would read these cases, right? Mm -hmm. And then most of them didn't make any sense for somebody mm -hmm. who's just starting out. But then yeah. you read Brown versus Board of Education, and it's a story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I asked my professor, why is this written this way? You know, and he said, because it was written for the people. It was not written as, you know, you write the, the you write it up and then you put it in a book and then you don't think about it anymore. No, this was because the only way this 
was going to take effect was if the people understood it and they could picture what an equal society looked like. And it was the responsibility of the creative people, like you said, to give that to them. And they might not even be able to give it in a way, in the way that they saw it, but enough for a revolution to begin. So I have a question for you. Okay. You have these stories inside of you, right? You have the Mary, you have all of these stories. Mm -hmm. What kind of responsibility do we have? You know, you can say, I don't want to be burned. (laughs) I don't want, I got kids, man. I I can't be, right. I can't be set on fire. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, But the average person Mm -hmm. who has a story to tell, where do you pull that responsibility from? Where do you, what do you access to say, well, I'm not just going to sit back like everybody else and, you know, where does that pull come from? Because I know you have it. You have that pull to share those stories. And when you hear other stories, because it's your job, when you hear those stories, it's Mm -hmm. your responsibility to kind of move them along the track to get to everybody else. So tell me where that responsibility inside you comes from. Sure, sure. Well, you know, even when we were talking and at first, you know, it was like, okay, going to do something on uh, the power of your story and storytelling. And then even with us walking it through, it was like, wait a minute, you know, we need to talk about literary activism here and what that is. And I had been studying all of this stuff for, you know, really it was the passing of my father and understanding my story and where I came from that I was able to stumble and come across all of these, all of these wonderful, you know, these courageous women um, that were, you know, just like me. Um, And I had them and I didn't quite know what it was for, but You know, when things like this happen, we look at the world, we look at the shift, we look at this awakening, we look at this, uh, you know, this this awakening, this great conscious awakening, you know, it, it is the time for us to now take a look at our gifts and see what it is that we can contribute to this movement. Two years ago when I started studying all of these women and all of that, I didn't know what, what it was for. I just knew that I was fascinated by them. I knew I had to write it down. I knew eventually I'd write a book. And like I told you, it's like the more when I would discover one, it's like another one would come. Like who is but Mary Prince? I had no idea about her. I was going to Bermuda and I had already started studied all of these other women and I was going to Bermuda my daughter simply said to me you know you travel all the time you really don't do a good job of taking pictures and you know telling folks what you're doing where what you're doing there so literally it was me looking up different places in Bermuda where I could go and take pictures maybe one day filming and taking pictures so I could put on social media I came across Mary Prince in her house okay Mary Prince house who is this Can you imagine the mind blow when I'm like, wait a minute, not only have I been discovering this stuff, um, you know, researching this stuff, but here comes the mother of all stories. I mean, I'm saying the mother of literary activism for black folks, Mary Prince. Right along. So I there is, and again, now we also look at this why I love Suzanne Suzanne so much. The marvelous that these stories, and I may sound a little new agey mumbo jumbo here, but these things find you. That's, and you just have to be open enough. Whatever it is, these stories find you, and your life experiences are not in vain that everything that happens to you, everything that has happened to you, all of these things, they're for a reason. It's Mm. just a matter of sitting and digging deep because if I didn't sit and think about it, well, okay, she asked me to, I can speak about the power of the story. Wait a minute, hold on. I've been talking about, just writing about this stuff that's in a pile for like two years now. Now is the time to use it for what I would say what is it? What have you been through? Or what 
story um, have you been given or what is it about one of your ancestors that you know the story of that you need to just maybe dig a little deeper that has relevance to now each of us have a role in this resistance. All of us do. I'm not a writer. Well, I'm a writer, but I'm lazy. So <laughs> for now, for now <laughs> what I do is I, I help push the stories of, of people who are my rock stars, which are writers. Eventually my book is coming. But um, yes. no, I'm not lazy. I'm busy right now pushing their their busy. stuff out. Right? That's um, what we're gonna go with. We're busy. gonna get busy. I'm busy doing what my role in the resistance might be. I can't be burned. What are these children gonna do when their mama burned? Right? <laughs> so, exactly. So, so now my father was an activist, like big time activist, and I'm my father's daughter. So it's in my DNA. It's in my blood but I just never knew how am I supposed to, but I understand. And in this great awakening, awakening, I know I was talking to somebody today and we were talking about, you know, how this is just a strange place. It feels weird. It feels people are going through anxiety. People are not quite sure of their footing. People are not, but it is a great awakening, a great awakening of consciousness. And it's for you to sit with yourself and figure out what is my role in this? And once I figured out, because I was like, "What? okay, I'm a publicist. I, I run this business and um, I, I do, um, you know, plan tours and get people on media and all of that. But I'm like, nobody's touring. Uh, nobody is uh, going on media talking about books right now. What is my role in this? But literary activism has been something that I've been writing about, I mean, and, and doing research about for two years. And boom, when that hit me, literary activism for such a time as this. That's right. What gift do you have for such a time as this? What story are you sitting on for such a time as this? Mm. Maybe you need to go back into your family and ancestral history to look back because you know what? It's not only a collective karmic debt that's happening right now that has to be paid and reckoned with and balanced and all of that. But what about within ourselves? Mm. What is it within ourselves that we need to look inside and say, you know what, I should be doing more of this. Mm. So writers, what is it inside of you that you have that you might have to just sit with yourself for a while and say, you know what, that story that of my grandfather, that you know, when he resisted or when they tried to take his land or when they, they tried to kill him or they tried to do it, what story is it that could be relevant for this time that might inspire a young activist? That might, because these stories help keep our activists going. It gives them reason and purpose. Can you imagine now in the Caribbean or somebody just hearing about these stories? Okay, I'm out there. But guess what? This is for Mary Prince. This is for the Nardal sisters. This is for, and not only that, who might be sitting at home thinking, okay, well, what is the strategy now? Let me look and see what blueprint these sisters did. Let me look at Paulette Nardal. Even, I think her name is Mama Cecile, who was the woman who got all of the fighters together in the Haitian revolution the night before and was like, we're coming together and we are uniting. And they did their rituals, their prayers, their whatever. And this woman poured into all those fighters and they were riled up. And by the time they were done, they overthrew the French army all because of, but there was a knowing, there was an access to the marvelous all of them did that gave them, that dared for them to believe that that was possible. So sit with yourself, talk to the ancestors. There's nothing wrong with sitting and saying, you know what, I'm not quite sure what my role is here, but let me sit with myself for a minute and dig deep. What can I do? What is my role, even if it means Every evening, I'm going to spend a half an hour with my children to tell them stories about who they are so that they walk different in this world. They mm -hmm. walk their head up high, even if it means putting, giving your children some armor and backbone. That's still contributing to the resistance because you're raising soldiers. 
You're raising soldiers who may not even be out there, but the power of the pen, the power of our stories. Let us never ever discount the power of our storytelling and what it is we were brought here to do. It's in our DNA. It's in those blue waters when you're flying over the Caribbean and you're seeing those waters, those azure, the beautiful water over there. There is so much underneath that. So it's up to us. Lauren Francis Sharma, I remember we were talking one day and she said she truly believes that stories are deposited in you, that they are given to you. That, you know, and, and I think Toni Morrison said the same thing, that these stories that you think you just get, they're given to you. And it's up to you to tell them because she said she was given a story one time, she didn't do anything with it and she truly saw somebody else write that same story. And that thing will rip your heart out. <laughs> I'm telling you. That you were meant to do. Do it. That, there is nothing more disappointing than watching somebody else tell your story. Now, before we go. Okay. I was going to say, we you talked. Did a focus, focus Summit, if you didn't work on it, if you didn't put this together, this is your contribution to the resistance. Man. And I'm telling you, when it, we started planning this well before anybody's pandemic. It just wasn't going to be done this way. Right. Um, but the crazy thing is, it wouldn't have reached this many people the way that I had wanted to do it. So like you said, for such a time as this, it ended up being better than anything we could have actually done right. in person. Now, I'm still right. going to do it in person. Right. right. Still need to do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it was the changes that it, it was insane. Yeah. It was yep. insane. So when we're talking about if you are given a story and you don't tell it, somebody else will tell your story. That is something that has happened in the Caribbean, in America, to Black people and people of color, Native Americans. It has happened to Indigenous people. It has happened to a lot of people. Other people are telling our stories, but we have access to them so that we can tell them ourselves. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of go into why it's so important for us to tell our own stories? Uh, 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 uh. I know it's a, I know it's a huge question. It's probably like a whole other keynote. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is a whole like, story question. Itself, because I will tell you that the historian for Firebird, they're white women. The historians, the people that are considered, oh, well, go talk to such and such. She's the historian on this. It's a white woman. Mary Prince, Bermuda, they have given, um, they just had a grant for a woman who lives in Nova Scotia, who's a professor, God bless her. But her name is Margo. Go figure. And she's Canadian. Go figure. But um, it's the wrong Margo telling the story, right? But they have given this, this lady, uh, she's a professor of uh, uh, slave, for, for I don't know the, the, the word, the, the, the name of the actual study that she teaches, but she actually is teaching the history of um, slave stories in the, uh, across the transatlantic. She's teaching this in Nova Scotia. Well, she became an expert on uh, Mary Prince and she gets uh, grants and all of that for her writing. But how on earth can you tell a story from our perspective if you're not us? Because this is what ends up happening. When I went to Copenhagen, the white researchers, they're only telling the stories of, you know, what happened in the trial and on this day and that day. And, you know, the stories that went back to Copenhagen that were propaganda, that the stories were being told from the perspective of white folks. So it was like these devils, these cannibals, these None of those people in in St. Croix ate anybody. Um, there were no cannibals there. But the stories that were going back and they were riding with 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 um, fire in their eyes and the devil had taken them over. That's a perspective that you know the news stories were going back to Copenhagen with. 
Well, you know, thank God there were some activists in there that said, you know, you really got to look at, the, at who's telling these stories. Um, the abolitionists were like, who who's telling these stories? You got to take it with a grain of salt. However, still, the overwhelming perspective is uh, from, you know, the courts. But there's no human element to these women. They had children. They had families. They had husbands. They had people back home. What happened to those children? What happened to the family? Uh, they were ripped apart. I mean, we only know, and like I told you, that when we went to Copenhagen, we we went through every single jail record two uh, years before, like the census that they would take every six months to say who was in the jail. The narrative is that these women were in a women's jail. So let's get a little perspective here. These are black women that went to Copenhagen. A lot of them never saw over there in Denmark, never saw black people before. Never. So you mean to tell me that these women who were accused and propaganda stories going on and on and on and on, they were they were accused of burning down uh, fellow folks from Denmark's homes. They were looked at as so. Do you think they were treated, you know, in a humane way? So when we went there and we're looking at the census, doing our research, two years before, two years after, after there was no record of these three women in that women's jail. No, but well, what does that mean? Okay, we had gone to the head research over there. We're like looking, we're showing him. We're going through all the records. He's looking on his computer, looking confused, looking, huh, the, well, maybe, can we see the men's jail records? Doesn't look like they were there either, huh? So where were these women? Either, now they got pictures of an empty jail cell, pictures, this is the jail, this is the, no pictures or record of these women. However, way out in Denmark and like the boonies, there was this hardened criminals jail. At that time, we were just so, our heads were just, the researcher said to us, I hate to say it, but it doesn't look like these women were ever in this jail. It took us three hours to discover that, three hours because nobody's really taken the time to go and research what happened and what was life like for these women in that jail. All we know is they were released 10 years later and allowed to go back home for hard labor. But what was it like wherever they were and how were they treated in those jails? We don't know because they were never looked at like human beings. We know nothing about these women we do know the court stories. We do know the newspaper stories, but there's nothing that makes these women human, black women and mothers and just, just flesh. There's nothing that humanizes these women. So it is important. Now we knew to go back there and let's see what it was like. This is the perspective we're coming from. I know that happened, but what happened to them? They supposedly wrote a book. What was going no one has taken the time to do that research, but that's what happens when we are not in charge of our stories and we are not taking the time to go and look and accurately write down historical record. It means that they are not human. There is no human record stories of how did they feel? How did they cope? What happened to their children? Did their children cope? Did they, nothing. So we continue to be savages. We continue to be people who, um, you know, pe we continue to be people who, who are, you know, nothing to us. So treat them any kind of way. Nothing that makes us human. Until we take our story. Look at it now. Cameras, George Floyd would not be human if a camera did not record this man's last breath. Everyone around this world looked at it and said, did that man just die in front of me? Hmm. There's no I understand. human element. And, there, and you saw that there was this effort to rewrite the whole thing. Well, yes. he was on drugs. Well, he was a yes. star. Well, he was a, it doesn't matter. Was he and he had a heart condition and he had several underlying conditions and all of these other things. He was human. A father, a brother. Uh, yes. You can look and see a little girl saying my dad changed the world. 
because we are recording this stuff. Yes. Yes. So, and we are taking the photos and we are on the ground and we are writing and we are tweeting and we are sharing our stories ourselves. And I think that's a huge, huge thing. And I believe that the woman who took the video was a black woman. 17 years old. Took the video. And it's like, you know, they're like, how could she have done that and not flinched, right? To be able to be there for that. Listen, nobody else can do that because we've been doing it for hundreds of years. We have had to watch this for hundreds of years. Absolutely. So there is no other person to tell the story for us. It's just us and it's it's just you. That's the only person there that can tell it the yeah. way it needs to be told. Right, just one thing, people oh, are yes. trying to, you know, why didn't she jump in? Why didn't she, why didn't she look at the impact of her video? If she had jumped in and stopped telling the story, see, this is why we had to have this, this conversation. Look. What if she had jumped in? And put that camera down. And the story would never have been told. The it power. never would have happened. The we power. would not. Ooh. Okay, all right then. Listen. The power. See, we always get here. <laughs> we always find ourselves we do. in the air. We do. The power of a single story. Mm. Mm -mm. Well, well then I think I think well see everybody say oh why didn't you do anything I am doing something and when we're sitting at home uh -huh. and we're like I'm not out in the streets literary activism those video activists those artists who are creating those moving photographs and paintings and things that get shared millions of times. I mean, that's activism. That's it. Ooh. While people might be, this poor girl, she's home depressed. She's, oh, people are attacked. The power of that story created a worldwide movement. And if she didn't tell it, somebody else was gonna have to die. They already and someone did. else. The police report that said nothing uh, he was resisting. Where was the resistance? Let's go look at that story. Mm, mm, mm. The power of a single story. Mm. Well then. And we have to be the ones to tell it. Mocha, thank you. Our conversations are always so good. And I am just blessed that you are willing to share these conversations that we have with everybody. Cause I know some stories are gonna come out of this. Yeah. I, I know it. And I somebody hope. is going to be moved. I hope so. To tell their story. It's my prayer. <sighs> <sighs> Thank you. Girl. We Thank always you. end up here. Just, I feel <laughs> just tired. I always end up speechless like. <laughs> like now what we gonna do? I know, I need a cigarette. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't even smoke. It's like, I don't smoke, but I need to do something. I don't. <laughs> Girl, thank you for you and what you do. And even giving people like me a platform to talk about this. This, this is my, because of you, I can contribute. And I feel like I can contribute because of you. So come on, Summit. Mama, keep doing it. Keep doing it. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate you for coming on. At some point, we will tell the story of how we got here. Because <laughs> that alone, I think that needs to be on the stage. It, it sure does. Because I'd have to reenact. Yes. <laughs> <The foolishness laughs> oh, thank you so much. Oh, anytime. I'm at your disposal. How can we support you in what you're doing right now because you're doing some pretty amazing things. Thank so you. So I like 
I remember telling you 2020, everybody's like, oh, put it in the trash. Yeah. I'm, like, yeah. Nope, I'm not putting 2020 in the trash. It's not no. done yet. No, it's not done. It's not done. It's not done. Well, we just started Milk Media uh, Publishing, and uh, we're coming out with our first book, Eat to Live. Um, uh, we signed Russell Simmons, and he is using his knowledge of um, it, it's a post pandemic guide to healthy, healthy living. That if it's COVID, if it's whatever, whatever's coming our way, you know, let's learn to eat as a community, let's learn to eat to live. Let us set ourselves up so that by the time these pandemics come, we're already in a healthy position so that we're not impacted as a community. So uh, we have that and we have a lot of other writers coming. You know, we've got it under this umbrella called Peace in the Pandemic. But, you know, again, timing and all of that. Who knew that while we were working on all of that stuff, that there would be this day of reckoning in the publishing company of, you know, Black folks and white authors talking about how much money they've got and black authors saying, but wait a minute, I'm a New York Times bestseller and I never got your kind of money. So New York Times doing a story on, you know, the um, inequity in publishing. And it just so happened that that was the day that we announced Mocha Media, a new digital content and publishing company. So again, it's timing. It's 2020. It's, it's putting that balance back. So whatever we can do to contribute. So I thank you know, the ancestors, God, the universe for putting that idea in, in our minds. We didn't know there was going to be a pandemic. We didn't know there was going to be, you know, all of this unrest. We just went with it. So I encourage everybody again, the ideas that you get, just take them and flow. Be fluid. Be open. Listen, because you never know what the impact is. Now, I hope local media comes and, you know, takes off. So right. um, for such a time as this. And now, I was going to say, now is the time. This is the best time to be Black. I, I, I mean, not great, great, but, right. you know, if you want to do something, people are finally listening. So, and you don't know when they're going to stop listening. <laughs> so, so jump out. They're putting their money where their mouth is. So think about that when you're thinking about how can you, because they all want to hear from us now. That's right. That's right, because it's lucrative to hear from us right now. So it is. I want to jump in. All right. Mocha, thank you. All right. Again. <laughs> Cannot wait to yes. see what happens with Mocha Media. I know it's going to be fantastic. I mean, what a start. What a start. Like, I really believe <laughs> when you start there, I mean, I know. I know. There's only one way, one direction to go. You just I know. Keep moving. To keep it moving, keep keep fluid and keep accessing that marvelous for new ideas. They're That's just it. waiting for you. Access. That is it. Still the mind. Access it. And it's ours. It's it, ours. It's our birthright. So yeah. and the ancestors are clapping for us now. <laughs> so cheering. They're cheering us on. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, thank you. Everybody. I hope you enjoyed the Soka Mom Summit. I hope you have been encouraged by these last three days to tell your story. We have given you every reason, every example. We have led by example. We have told our stories. And now it's your turn. Thank you for joining us for the Soka Mom Summit. We appreciate you and we will see you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.